Uh, before I introduce our speakers, uh, I want to say a few words about the Saskatchewan Environmental Society, which been operating since uh, 1970 on important issues such as sustainable energy, climate solutions, water protection, biodiversity preservation, reduction of toxic substances in our environment. If you aren't already a member, I encourage you to join Saskatchewan Environmental Society. Uh, you can always find more about uh, our diverse, diverse projects and activities and how to get involved by checking out uh, our website at uh, www.environmentalsociety.ca. If you would like to receive email notifications uh, about events uh, in uh, our series, like Sustainable Speaker Series, uh, you can email uh, info at environmentalsociety.ca and indicate that uh, you want to be notified about the uh, Sustainable Speaker Series. Um, so we have uh, two speakers today, Margaret Asmus and Pablo Rodriguez. Margaret first got involved with Saskatchewan Environmental Society back in 1982, when she was first hired as a summer student. She has since been involved with the organization in a variety of ways, as a volunteer, as a board member, as staff. Her interest in environmental issues also extends into other areas of her life. For example, Margaret uh, was sustainable so, sorry, sustainability coordinator at the University of Saskatchewan uh, Office of Sustainability for 14 years. In uh, 2017, Margaret was trained as a climate reality leader by Al Gore's Climate Reality Project. At home, she always uh, actively looking for ways to reduce energy, water use, uh, reduce her waste and produce her own food. <laughs> um, our second speaker is Pablo Rodriguez. Pablo's work has focused uh, on the intersection of climate change, sustainable agriculture, and environmental sciences across vulnerable socioeconomic sectors. His academic and professional experience has been gained primarily in Latin America, Belgium and Canada. He recently worked with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society as climate change coordinator and collaborated with provincial organizations on local climate change action. He holds the position of Saskatchewan Regional Organizer at the Community Climate Hub Project to support uh, local climate action at the municipal level. Last year, Pablo obtained his Climate Reality Leader Certificate at the first Climate Reality Project Leadership Global Training. So with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Margaret and Pablo. Okay, well, I'll get started. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Um, um, I'll speak for about uh, 40 minutes and then um, I'll turn it over to Pablo, who will follow up with a, a shorter presentation on ways to get involved with climate issues in, in Saskatoon. So I'm going to share my screen now, and then I will um, get rid of my face, my talking head, uh, so that you can focus on, this, uh, on the slides more than on me. So I will do that right now. Okay, um, I've come to the conclusion that uh, climate change is an extent, existential threat to us. And if the current trajectory continues, it'll, it'll undermine ecosystem capacity, cause economic disruption and social upheaval worldwide. As a global community, I think we're starting to understand the environmental and economic costs of the climate crisis, but the 
the human or social costs are still flying under the radar. Today, I would like to focus on the, con the, the human or the social consequences of, of climate change. Uh, before I get started, given that this is the um, sustainability speaking speaker series, I want to start with the, uh, the, the concept of sustainability. Um, this this three-legged stool conceptualization of sustainability is, is obviously an oversimplification, but for our purposes today, it illustrates that sustainability necessarily includes environment, society, and economy. And if one of the legs of that stool is cut short, everything eventually crashes to the ground. It, uh, similarly, if we put all of our efforts into one of the legs, say the economic legs, the stool also becomes lopsided and eventually crashes. Nothing is ever just an economic issue or a social issue or an environmental issue. Um, climate change is a really good example of this. It was initially viewed as a purely environmental issue. Now it's turning into a massive uh, economic problem and the, and the social problems are quickly emerging. I want to focus on those social impacts of climate change today, those issues that directly impact people. But before jumping into that, I'd like to take a few minutes just to remind people of some climate change basics, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. So the basic problem is, is that we are uh, spewing an awful lot of man-made global, global warming pollution into the thin, thin shell of our atmosphere. Um, and it's coming from all sorts of different sources. Um, it's coming from uh, mining, industrial agriculture, melting of the permafrost, burning of forests and cropland, transportation. Uh, but the, the biggest source is the burning of fossil fuels. We're getting these greenhouse gases that are uh, a natural part of the, the, um, the atmosphere and that in fact have uh, enabled us to have climate stability for a very long time. The problem is now that we are dumping so much in there that it is altering the, the uh, the atmosphere and the climate systems because the exchange of heat uh, between the earth uh, through the atmosphere and, and outside is no longer working properly. In an ideal uh, earth uh, scenario, the earth energy system um, and, and it, where it's working well, the amount of energy that escapes is roughly equal to the amount of energy that stays within the atmosphere, solar radiation. But burning fossil fuels means greater concentrations of greenhouse gases have disrupted this process and have put the Earth's energy equilibrium out of balance. Uh, we've seen the impacts of this uh, year by year. Our um, temperatures, the, the global averages are going up, and, uh, and there's a pretty good chance that 2020 is going to be, this is, this is a slide from last year, uh, but it, it looks like 2020 is also looking to uh, beat uh, the record. Now, some of, some of the consequences of this we've seen locally. Um, here in Saskatchewan, for example, we had the, the 2015 uh, wildfires that cost the province over a hundred million just to fight, let alone uh, talking about insurable losses. Uh, the province blew through its fire fighting budget. It didn't, and thousands of people had to be evacuated from the region and out of province firefighters were brought in to help with the effort. Um, the, the Fort McMurray fires that uh, uh, were not here directly in Saskatchewan, but obviously very close neighbors, that those fires in 2016 forced the evacuation of over 100,000 people, uh, many of whom are still rebuilding their lives and their homes. About uh, 1,800 homes were lost, and the Fort McMurray fire is costing insurance companies an estimated uh, $3.5 billion, making it Canada's costliest uh, natural disaster ever. And obviously these events, like the, the Saskatchewan fires and also the fire in Fort McMurray, have a human cost. People 
are losing their livelihoods, their homes, um, their, their huge personal impacts. In terms of agriculture, that is also happening. Um, you know, the 1999-2004 the drought was the worst in over 100 years in the Canadian prairies and, and agricultural uh, production dropped significantly. And at the same time, while, we, while drought was happening in some parts of the province, <laughs> other parts of the province uh, experienced floods, which also had a significant impact on, on agriculture and uh, huge agricultural losses, again, uh, uh, impacting people uh, and their livelihoods and their lives and their homes. In all of these local examples, there's, there's been an environmental cost, an economic cost, but also a human cost. People's lives, homes, livelihoods have all been uh, severely impacted. But we have to look beyond just at home. Just as climate change is impacting people in Saskatchewan and Canada, the impacts are even greater in developing countries uh, something that is not without consequence to those of us in the developed world. Um, Pope Francis, in his encyclical on climate change, recognized the, the impact that climate change would have um, on uh, throughout the world, but that its worst impact will be felt by developing countries in in all aspects, in terms of environment, economic, and social impacts. One of the biggest things we need to face is uh, climate migrants. Um, and I'm going to go into this a little bit, but uh, certainly the, the um, it's recognized that, that climate change, it's, it's not the cause of a lot of migration, but it's a, it, it's a threat multiplier. So if you're in parts of the world where there's a lot of, already a lot of uh, geopolitical uh, strife and you add climate change impacts onto that, it multiplies those impacts. Uh, certainly um, the climate change was a contributing factor or has been seen as a contributing factor to the Arab Spring, uh, the war in Syria, and also uh, conflicts that are happening in, in the Horn of Africa. The UN uh, estimates that in 2019, 24 million people were displaced by extreme weather almost three times more than by conflict and violence. And this has impacts in countries beyond where uh, the, the, the climate is, is creating the problems. Um, you know, even Brexit was partly linked to this. Uh, the most powerful billboard in the Brexit campaign in the UK was this one showing a seemingly endless line of refugees, obviously from the Middle East. And the slogan is, the European Union has failed us all. But uh, <laughs> maybe it's, it's not the European Union, uh, but rather uh, the, the, the flood of people who are moving out of parts of the world where they uh, are no longer able to feed their families or to, to uh, pursue their livelihoods and they need to go somewhere. And this, you know, th th those migrations are having problems not only in the countries where the drought or the food production issues uh, or the flooding or whatever is, and I'll get into some of those as I go along, are happening, but are having um, socioeconomic and, and sociopolitical impacts in the countries uh, where these people move to. Uh, people want to save their families, so they're moving from place to place. Uh, it's also happening in, in, in our own continent. Uh, in the United States, we've seen flows of refugees from Central America, not so much Mexico as it used to be, and uh, much of this is also related to 
the, the uh, what we call the dry corridor. Um, the, as you can see, if you go down into the lower part of, of uh, North America there and into Central America, we have land that is uh, dry and getting increasingly drier. Again, putting people in a situation where they are in countries that are politically unstable, but now they're in addition to that having trouble feeding their families. Um, in, this, in this, this is a projection of what that dry corridor may look like in uh, 2095. And you can see if you look at the at sort of the, the, the darker the color, the, the drier it's getting. So, you know, while we're, you know, there have been all sorts of solutions, including walls at the Mexico border and that sort of thing. But as long as that area keeps becoming more inhospitable to food production and to people, those people are going to want to go somewhere. Um, we certainly saw that in um, Syria, in the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, we've, there's been a lot of attention, especially on Syria in the last couple of years or the last decade, because it's, it's been a decade now. But we should have also been paying more attention to the climate re related drought, which was one of the worst that we've uh, seen in, in recent years. The, excuse me, the, um, if we look at the, before the civil war in Syria ever started, there was a climate related drought that destroyed 60% of the farmland in Syria, turning it into desert, uh, lost 80% of their goats uh, and livestock, and over one and a half million people were driven from the farming areas of Syria into the cities, colliding with those who are already there, some of them refugees from the Iraq war. So we have um, a situation where people are streaming into cities, there's food scarcity and already political discontent. So the, the, the drought directly fed into um, the <laughs> explosion, I guess, uh, which is now the, the, the ongoing war in Syria. This was recognized. Um, it's, uh, it was recognized in 2008, uh, even in the States, where they um, said, you know, this is, this is beyond our capacity to deal with. What do we do? You know, we, we don't know what to do. Uh, you know, 60% and eventually 60% of the farms were destroyed and all of those refugees collided with others in Syria and we're still living with the consequences of that. And it's not just limited to, it's limited to, uh, or it, it expands into those countries that are taking the, uh, that are shouldering the burden of, of people who are, who cannot pursue their life where they are. In, in the case of Syria, of course, there's, there's civil war going on. But again, as I said, you know, that civil war was exaggerated by the climate reality, the, the, the drought. Um, you know, a great burden of, of the refugee flow out of Syria was shouldered by neighboring countries like Jordan, but it's also spilling over into Europe. And uh, here people are try desperately trying to get into a train in Croatia, uh, Croatia, Croatia, and this caused a lot of disruption in the political equilibrium in many countries in Europe, which we're still seeing now, uh, especially in countries um, uh, along the southern border there, to, uh, with like Italy and Greece and that sort of thing, and, and, and are seeing ongoing issues around that. But this isn't just happening in the Middle East. Here, for example, uh, is a picture of Vietnam where uh, an ongoing drought has, uh, is creating about 25,000 
migrants every year because they no longer can use their land. In Chile, um, 2019 was one of the, the driest years in at least six, uh, six deca decades, and an agricultural emergency uh, was declared. Climate change, um, I mean, it, it obviously, if it's a drought, you can't grow stuff, but it also leads to other challenges for crops that we rely on. The three most prominent uh, challenges crops face are heat stress, pests, and disease expanding their ranges. Just to reiterate, um, one of the main reasons that people move is because they don't have anything to eat. Uh, scholars who study this tell us this again and again, they're not terrorists, they're not criminals, they're hungry and they're trying to feed their families. We're seeing projections for declines in crop yields of significant amounts in corn, wheat, rice, and soy. And these four crops make up two thirds of the calorie intake for humanity all around the world. So when you see these kind of drops in yield, that's very serious for those who are already few, uh, food insecure. Here you can see a graph that shows sort of uh, food surpluses and deficits across the world. And there are some regions like uh, North America and South America where there are always uh, large surpluses. Uh, there are swing regions like the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Sometimes they're in a deficit and sometimes they're in a surplus. And Australia is a significant surplus country. But Central America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Western Europe, North Africa and the Middle East, particularly in Asia, they're in chronic food deficit. And some of these regions are also being impacted most severely by climate change, specifically uh, the Middle East uh, uh, and uh, Central America. So these, these um, areas end up importing food from other regions, but it means that if there are disasters in other, it, one region can reverberate and affecting the food supply in other parts of the world. Why? Well, how does climate change affect food? Obviously, drought makes it impossible to grow food, but climate change contributes to other challenges for the crops we rely on. Uh, the most prominent being heat stress, pests, and uh, diseases ex expanding their ranges. Warmer temperatures uh, are reducing yields of maize and wheat and barley in the tropics and the sub, um, subtropics. This was actually something that, that many sciences didn't entirely understand until recently. Uh, that there's a there's an upper threshold where generally heat is good for crops, but it, there there does come a threshold where uh, it has a detrimental effect. There's also the issue of pests. Um, this is from the UN that there's a link between climate change and the unprecedented unprecedented crisis plaguing Ethiopia and, and uh, East Africa. But that's not the only place in the world that it's happening. This is a picture of India, of a uh, massive locust swarm in India, uh, and which is now threatening to, to go to other areas. Uh, it is definitely climate related. Uh, because uh, the, 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 the conditions for reproduction of the, the pests in a lot of cases are improving or expanding. In some cases, um, the, the 
CO2 itself, uh, so the, the, the greenhouse gas CO2, gives an advantage to some pests and actually diminishes the plant's ability to defend itself. Um, Japanese beetles that fed on the leaves of plants grown in higher CO2 atmospheres live longer and lay more eggs. And the plant's natural defenses are, are hampered by the CO2 levels going up. So in addition to um, you know, the, 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 the heat impacting on the ability for some pests to survive, in some cases, it's, it's actually the CO2. Uh, CO2, rising CO2 concentrations are also threatening global nutrition by reducing levels of nutrition. Uh, we're seeing important nutrients like copper, magnesium, and calcium being diminished as the CO2 levels themselves go higher. Um, and this is a problem because in order to get the same load of nutrients, more food needs to be consumed. The other issue is uh, oceans. Uh, there was a recent finding showing the nutritional quality of seafood uh, goes down as the water temperature goes up. Um, this is a really important one because, uh, oh, sorry, I think I accidentally made a mistake there. Um, the, the, like, I, I believe it's 75% of, of protein consumed by um, humans comes from the ocean. So if we are, um, through climate change, not only threatening uh, the survival of some species, but also threatening the nutritional uh, value of those species that, that remain, uh, this has real implications for uh, the, 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 the availability of protein to, to many people. In some cases, higher temperatures also um, cause toxin accumulating in plants and livestock, threatening the health of, of humans and animals, and in some, in some cases, even causing, causing death. And uh, high CO2 levels have shown to increase disease severity in, in rice and wheat. Again, two very uh, important crops for, for humans. The IPCC uh, summarized it like this. There may be a threshold of global warming beyond which current agricultural practices can no longer support large human civilizations. So I just want you to think about this because this harkens back to what I said a couple of slides back about people moving. So people move when they can no longer feed their families. But even if they stay in place, what are the implications here for uh, long-term um, nutrition? Of, of people throughout the world, especially in those areas that are already food vulnerable. Related to all of this is uh, heat. There are some areas of the world that may just become uninhabitable. Um, and as they become uninhabitable, where do they go? Here's a map that shows areas that are considered uninhabitable due to um, uh, ex uh, extremely high temperatures at certain times of the year. Current conditions are shown by the, the black areas. If climate change continues as it has been going, it's estimated that the area that is hatched may become the uninhabitable zones. So what happens then? What happens when uh, people live in areas that at least for part of the year cannot be survived by humans? Where do they move? And what sort of implications does that have for the areas that they move to? 
we've already seen some examples of that. Uh, you know, imagine uh, 74 degrees Celsius reached in, in Iran in 2015. Uh, the media has been picking up on it too. There may be areas of the Indian subcontinent that may be uh, where people can no longer live uh, because the heat is so unbearable. And this also becomes a, um, a social justice issue because who are the people who are most vulnerable to heat? The poor and the homeless, the elderly, infants and children, uh, agricultural workers, the poor, people who have to work outside, who can't shelter in place, the mentally ill. So even within those countries, um, the, there's a social justice issue, but certainly there's a social justice issue between countries. I mean, here in, in, in Canada, if you know, parts of our country were to become too hot, we can shelter in our air conditioned homes or in our well insulated homes. In countries uh, such as uh, parts of or uh, parts of the Indian subcontinent, um, that may not be possible where where homes are of, of not very good quality or a lot of people live on the street or a lot of people are forced to work outside. So this is this is really a social justice issue. And so, and not all of these people will be able to migrate the way others have been, but are impacted by the conditions there where they are. Another related issue is uh, sea level rise. Um, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but again, we have, uh, areas in the world that are already at risk from sea level rise. Uh, these are the top 10 cities uh, by population at risk. And these are the top 10 cities by assets at risk. Again, we have that same question that we have um, with what happens when people can no longer live there. Where do they go? How do, how do their neighbors react? How does the rest of the world react? It's the same question, whether they're moving because they can no longer feed their families, whether they're moving because it's too hot to bear, or whether they're moving because they're flooded. And I'm just going to brief, uh, touch really briefly on the issue of of air pollution. Um, the air pollution kills 9 million people uh, a year. And uh, this, of course, is also an issue that impacts uh, individuals as well as all, uh, communities and countries. Here's a map showing um, some statistics about deaths attributable to, uh, attributable to ambient air pollution. And of course, much of that air pollution are also the same emissions that create uh, greenhouse uh, climate change. So if we, if we solve one problem, if we are able to work towards solving the problem of greenhouse gas emissions and reducing them, we're also at the same time solving the problem of air pollution. And just a couple of, of uh, examples here, New Delhi, uh, if you look, I mean, I think we've all seen pictures like this in, in the news of, of India and China, where, where the air is just uh, incomprehensibly thick, and it, it's hard to imagine even living there, especially there, uh, those of us who live in Saskatchewan here, Bangkok. And this was just in 2019, so very recently, even in the West or, you know, uh, this is a, in Warsaw, um, you know, one wouldn't consider that necessarily a developing country, but even there, uh, the, the uh, air quality is causing health concerns. Something to just uh, mention in connection to air pollution was one of the things that they discovered during the um, 
1918 flu pandemic was that cities with high coal pollution saw a 10% higher mortality rates than those with, with cleaner air. And uh, we're, we're actually finding the same thing now with, with COVID-19 cases. In China, they, they found that polluted cities had uh, um, higher COVID cases than in areas with, with uh, less um, NOx and, and uh, particulate po uh, pollution. And actually found something similar, not at quite as high rates in the states that, that US um, death rates due to COVID are, are higher in, in counties with higher than average fine air, uh, fine particulate um, uh, air pollution. And this is just again sort of summarizing the cost of mortality from outdoor air pollution and uh, as a percentage of GDP in 2010. So these are the, the, the 15 largest CO2 emitters. Uh, Canada's fairly low. We're, we're quite lucky. We're a little bit isolated, but certainly in, in other countries where air quality is, is um, much worse, it's, it's, you, can, you can see the impact. And again, I mean, pollution and greenhouse gas emissions are often, not entirely, but often the same thing. So just returning to that, that sustainability diagram that I had, um, I guess I, I want to sort of emphasize that, that, you know, when we're talking about climate change, we're not just talking about environment. We're not just talking about uh, dollars or economy, but we're also talking about uh, society and, and how the, the instability that climate change can present either in terms of uh, food, food security, um, health, um, areas that are inhabitable, either due to flood or, or drought or heat, all contribute to uh, human suffering but also to social instability, which of course then also impact environment and economy. So we need to be thinking about um, climate change a little bit more holistically and not just as something that impacts polar bears or, or costs a lot of money when there's a flood. There are greater social concerns and we are not really uh, addressing or even thinking about how we deal with those. Even, even to date, we're not addressing them uh, adequately, as we can see by sort of the, 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 the political discourse around uh, migrants in both Europe and, and North America. So where does this leave us? Um, I mean, climate change is a very big challenge. I, I do believe that there are many um, solutions on the horizon, but we need to start accelerating those, those solutions. I believe that's happening to a certain extent. Uh, there's, there's, there's been a, a real uptake in understanding that climate change in fact is happening and, and in conversations about the solutions, but we also need to be bringing in that social justice piece and not just concentrating on the, on the environment and the economic uh, pieces of that. So my challenge to you in thinking about climate change is to, to live, yourself, live your life conscientiously, think about the things that you can do in your own life um, to, to reduce your carbon footprint, uh, embrace your influence. Uh, we all have much more influence than we think we do. Um, my husband is a very good example of this. He's a notorious email writer to politicians when something annoys him. He'll write a very polite and short news uh, email saying, you know, I really think that this is wrong. It's not always, he doesn't uh, bother to get into a lot of research. He just uh, states his opinion and what, what he thinks is um, the, uh, the, the problem and has actually uh, 
been pleasantly surprised at the response to that. And I think the most important thing is that you do tell those people who represent you in government that tackling the climate crisis is important. And this is an, this has nothing to do with where you are on the political spectrum. Uh, this should be a non-political issue. Uh, for some unfortunate reason here in North America, it has become politicized. In Europe, you don't see that. Um, governments of all stripes are tackling the climate crisis. Germany, which has been run by a, a fairly conservative government for, for decades now, is probably one of the leaders in, in dealing with the, the climate crisis. But our politicians will only do that if uh, they know that this is important to us. Uh, use your voice, use your votes, and use your choices. Um, and just to end off, I, oop, sorry, I, I have a couple of uh, uh, suggested resources for you. Um, the Saskatchewan Environmental Society has a lot of good resources on its website. Climate uh, Reality Canada has good resources, Climate Justice Saskatoon, and then the Prairie Climate Centre based out of the uh, University of Winnipeg in Manitoba has some wonderful resources on projections for um, the prairie region in terms of the sort of changes that we might see. And I'll end it on that. Uh, your world depends on it. So uh, each of us can do our little bit. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll turn it over to Pablo now. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, very, very nice and interesting. A lot of information here. Uh, about climate change. Uh, I'm just going to follow up a little bit on, and talk about uh, very briefly about the climate action in, in the province of Saskatchewan and particularly at the local level. So I'll just, so uh, as I was saying, I was um, uh, uh, briefly present about climate change action uh, in the province and particularly at the local level. We will uh, just go through quickly uh, um, some of the uh, uh, current governmental policies at the provincial level and also some local level. Uh, I will talk about uh, some organizations and only some because there is many others also working and that's one of the main issues that I'm going to talk about at the end. Uh, a little more communication about, uh, among the organizations working on climate change is, is needed. Uh, we will talk, I will talk a little bit about the youth movement and how they've been working and also what are the needs and how we can help the youth movement climate movement. And finally, a little more about the uh, Community Climate Hubs project uh, in Canada and how are we working in the province as well. So um, the uh, current governmental policies are happening mainly in at the provincial level with the uh, uh, provincial policy, the city of Saskatoon, and more recently, uh, Regina that has decided to move forward uh, uh, and build their uh, uh, climate change policy as well. So uh, the main uh, actions by the provincial government here are uh, more likely to be in the re regulatory framework for uh, 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 greenhouse gases emissions, particularly in the uh, oil and gas industry and the um, electricity production. Uh, also the um, uh, policies with, uh, within uh, SAS power about renewable energy, increasing that share of uh, uh, kind of energy within the grid and uh, the climate change resilience measurement framework, which it's mainly uh, focused on uh, the climate change adaptation. There is uh, some work being done and, and, and uh, there is many things going on, but definitely within the provincial level, a, a more uh, action is needed and we should uh, be taking a look at it as uh, because it's it's um, it's a huge problem and the, pro the province uh, needs to be working uh, in a deeper uh, sense in this uh, in the issue of climate change. After that, uh, we have uh, the city of Saskatoon. They have their uh, very uh, interesting uh, wide plan on climate action. Uh, they have developed uh, the mitigation strategy of or the low emissions community plan, which is already been implemented. There have been some uh, uh, issues, uh, not issues, but uh, some uh, regular uh, uh, kind of issues that you, you might get from uh, a new uh, and very 
uh, innovative uh, strategy regarding climate change. They are also working on the adaptation strategy for the local action and uh, also as part of this climate action plan, uh, the green infrastructure strategy. And as I said, uh, more recently, Regina has decided to uh, move forward on action and their action plan and they uh, should be getting their, uh, their own uh, uh, sustainability framework and action plan by the end of this year which will cover uh, many aspects, but is gonna be focused on community and municipal, municipal wide action plans. Uh, they are expecting to have the community engaged, uh, very engaged in, this, in the, the development of this plan uh, that will include a, a, report, a reporting framework so they can uh, track uh, uh, more efficiently uh, the development. And uh, also they have asked, and they would like to see the financial and economic impacts of this, uh, uh, sustainable framework and action plan. Uh, some of the local organizations uh, uh, last year I had the opportunity to work uh, uh, as a climate change coordinator within uh, the Saskatchewan Environmental Society and I had the pleasure to work with these organizations. I know there are many others but uh, this is uh, these are the ones that uh, are kind of working together and have been trying to uh, uh, gather and uh, to work towards a, a more concise uh, climate action in the province, and in, in particularly in, in Saskatoon and Regina. So uh, there is mostly uh, a, a local action, but also some uh, provincial, more provincial organizations such as the uh, Saskatchewan Public Health Association, which has a, a, has a provincial mandate, and they are all working and have worked in, in many ways into climate action. Uh, there's also, uh, particularly since 2018, the youth movement around the world and in Saskatchewan, uh, this movement has also been very uh, strong. Unfortunately, with COVID-19 and the pandemic, this, some of these uh, initiatives have been uh, a little bit diluted, but there is a, a strong uh, feeling and the uh, uh, motivation within the youth uh, particularly in these two, four, uh, in these four cities, uh, Melford, Swift Current, Regina, and Saskatoon. Uh, the Saskatoon, uh, uh, the uh, YXE Youth Climate Committee is very active and is working uh, very uh, constantly on climate action and also uh, the movement in Regina. And finally, uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit the um, community climate project, uh, which is a, a, a Canadian project uh, that uh, it's looking to uh, support local action uh, and uh, there's a lot of uh, resources that they have provided and they, uh, 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 and many other uh, uh, resources uh, still for, for uh, gathering uh, with uh, people, not only people, but uh, organizations working on it, such as the organizations that I just uh, mentioned before. So uh, this, the characteristics of this uh, project is to gather with people, uh, citizens, uh, local organizations and business with no uh, uh, political uh, specific political vision and public officials to work toward a better uh, climate action at the uh, municipal level. They have promote uh, particularly this peer-to-peer -peer support so they can uh, express their concerns about climate change to the uh, local officials. Um, the th three core uh, principles of these organizations is that they have to be local, citizen-driven and diverse. They have to gather all the interests uh, uh, from the uh, cities and the municipal level. Uh, they are guided by the, uh, or the goal, the climate goals are the ones uh, held by the Federation Canadian uh, uh, Municipalities. And uh, we have, fortunately, we have in the province the first uh, climate hub, the Regina Climate Hub that started last year, and we're still working on, on, on building up this hub. And uh, of course, everybody is welcome in, in this or any other hub that we will uh, start here in the province. So if you're interested in, in more information or even uh, join one of these uh, uh, organizations or particularly this, uh, the Climate Hub project, this, uh, you, you can contact those organizations that have been working on climate change or uh, uh, email me to this address, pablo.climatehub.ca. I am the uh, regional organizer for Saskatchewan for the Community Climate Hubs project. Thank you.